Hi, good morning. It is a privilege today that I'm joined by Jim Heppelman, the CEO of PTC. And uh, I've had a pleasure of knowing Jim for a few years. And uh, apart from being the CEO at PTC, he's, a, he's an engineer and a technologist at heart and has been instrumental in shaping the future of what the IoT industry has become today and is going to be um, in, in the times to come. Uh, with series of acquisitions, uh, starting from uh, Thingworks uh, to uh, Vuforia and now on Shape, I think Jim has uh, made a clear um, a strategy of, of integrating uh, all these uh, various acquisitions together and trying to build the entire digital thread story uh, for the world at large. Uh, so welcome, Jim. Uh, welcome you. to Infosys. Thank Thanks for giving us the time today. Uh, Jim, uh, we work with a lot of uh, industrial companies uh, in industrial manufacturing, CPG, retail, and pharmaceuticals. And we are seeing a significantly growing interest on IoT. But still, we sometimes believe that they are not taking these as global initiatives. Yeah. They are still remaining at factory level. What is it that you are seeing? And how do you think the companies will come to a point where they can truly do these like global initiatives? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of companies have been experimenting. And uh, many times the experimentations are interesting, mm -hmm. but sometimes they don't justify uh, ongoing investment to take it to the next level. So I think uh, what we've been seeing is that companies really need to focus on finding that intersection of transformation projects that are on one hand, you know, possible, of course, but also uh, very valuable and then repeatable or scalable. Right. Because what we're all looking for is to do something amazing and then cookie cutter, copy paste, if you will, and uh, do it across the, across the enterprise and maybe even across the entire uh, marketplace. So, you know, that's, that's the key thing is to find that intersection of uh, doable, valuable, and scalable. Absolutely. Well said. Doable, valuable, and scalable. And, and, and with the series of acquisitions that we talked about, and uh, clearly, and you've spoken in so many forums and even written about it in the smart connected enterprise and competition, how do you think that digital thread ties into this equation of doable, valuable, and scalable? Yeah, I mean, I think at some level what we're trying to do is to build, you know, a digital version of the physical world and mm -hmm. connect those two together. And I'd argue that uh, connecting them together is really what IoT and AR are really about. They're both boundary-crossing technologies. But the, the physical world's very complicated. There are many different versions of products and many different versions of factories and, and so forth. So... To me, digital thread is about uh, making sure we all understand the right configurations and versions of information to use in our next job, you know, in mm -hmm. our next task, and, uh, and then keeping everybody on the same page as we make engineering changes or uh, introduce new options and features or, or whole new product lines. So I think that, uh, you know, if you don't have a digital thread, it's very difficult to take this, this technology into broader production. Right. Because too many people end up on the wrong versions of uh, data, and then nothing's really accomplished. So, to me, that digital thread is a fundamental uh, connector of the digital and physical worlds. Great. And you did mention AR, and I can't help but um, uh, also mention the fact that you've been very passionate about whole augmented reality technology space. Uh, of course, you've acquired Vuforia, and I've heard you talk at the AR World Expo and many other uh, such events. Why do you think AR is such a defining technology for the OT space? AR has many different use cases, but if we go into the industrial world, mm -hmm. I like to say that AR is IoT for people. Okay. You know, conventionally we're thinking of the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. but if we want to connect people to the Internet and, and supply digital information in particular to frontline workers, you know, people who aren't sitting behind a computer but need this information in the form of manufacturing work instructions or service instructions or, uh, or assistance. Um, you know, AR is a way to decorate the natural world with digital information, and us humans know how to process that so easily. Mm -hmm. So it's a very powerful technology. And again, if you think about connecting the digital and physical worlds together, mm -hmm. there's the Internet of Things that deals with the physical assets and machines and products. And then there's, what do you do about the workers and the people? And, right. uh, and AR is really the answer. 
for that technology. But is this a misconception when people think um, AR is tied to the endpoints and, and limited by the devices that you serve them on? Or have you actually transcended those and made it more common purpose? Well, I think the most common AR device uh, that people use is their smartphone. Right. And uh, phones and tablets make fantastic AR devices, mm -hmm. you know, with one exception, and that is they tie up your hands. So the benefit of the glasses really is hands-free. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the phones and tablets deliver most of the value, you know, aside from the, the issue with the hands. Right. So I think a lot of uh, companies are exploring mm -hmm. AR. They're, they're trying it out. They're developing their content, mm -hmm. knowing that there are better and better hands-free devices coming. Mm -hmm. You know, the Microsoft HoloLens 2 is great. The, yeah. the Magic Leap uh, <laughs> second generation is coming out. You know, the glasses will get better and better. Mm -hmm. And what companies are really doing right now is building the technology stack and the content and starting with the devices everybody have, which are really the phones and tablets. Right. So if from the top of your mind, uh, what use case uh, comes to your mind as one of the best examples of AR being used in an industrial space? Well, one of the most powerful use cases that we've stumbled across recently is uh, capturing expertise and digitizing it so that it can be passed from one worker to another. Also oh, training purposes. Yeah, training, but, but really capturing of expertise okay. and then training. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the US and many other countries, we have a workforce demographics issue yeah. where the experts are retiring and then who will be around to train the new, the new workers who are hired. What if we could capture and bottle that expertise digitally and then keep it on the shelf and when a new worker's trained, bring it back into the plant and turn it loose? Uh, so it's a demographics issue, but it's also uh, sort of a best practices issue. Mm -hmm. If we can digitize and capture the best practices, then we can quickly elevate all of the workers and right. all of the plants up to that same level of expertise. So it's a very, very powerful technology, and it's extremely easy. And I can see that because, you know, most of our customers struggle with the fact that processes are not documented. A lot of tacit knowledge. Yeah. Experts have been there for many years. They know exactly how it is done. So if you could actually author using AR, which I believe what you're talking about, yes, yes, right? Yeah. And capture those work instructions exactly how they're done, then the difference between tacit and explicit also kind of goes away. Absolutely. And in fact, you're right. A big part of the problem is documentation because yeah. documentation is on a flat sheet of paper and the, and the world in front of me doesn't look like that flat yeah. sheet of paper. So uh, we allow people to capture the expertise mm -hmm. Convert it to a flat sheet of paper to a PDF file if they must, yes. but really store it as spatial computing data mm -hmm. that we can actually decorate the world with so that the new worker uh, walks into the environment and sees all the notes and, and content that the right. uh, expert who has since retired mm -hmm. left behind for them. So it's a very powerful concept. No, very well said. Um, Jim, you work with a lot of partners, but still I have uh, noticed that you have been very deliberate about curating a few strategic relationships, and some on the technology side, of course, Rockwell, Microsoft, et cetera, but also on the SIs. Yeah. And uh, we're proud to be one of your global platinum uh, system integrator partners. Yep. What is your expectation of how a global SI like us helps as a force multiplier to the message um, that we want to bring to the industrial world? Yeah, I mean, PTC made a decision some years ago that we really shouldn't be in the services business, mm -hmm. that we should have an ecosystem of partners like, like Infosys that can mm -hmm. do that. So, uh, you know, not only do we want partners, we actually have a, a need for, a dependency upon uh, partners like Infosys. So, uh, yeah, what we'd like to do is, uh, of course, have Infosys take our technology mm -hmm. and, and partner technology from Rockwell, Ansys, Microsoft, you know, as appropriate, and package that together into solutions at the customer site that unlock business value. Mm -hmm. You know, if you remember, I said we got to find things that are doable, scalable, and uh, yeah. and yeah, repeatable. And, yeah. and we're looking for your help in, <laughs> in doing that. So uh, it's very important for us, and you know, we're pleased with how our partnership has continued to develop, and you know, look forward to taking it, you know, even to greater levels going forward. No, thank you so much. Looking at your uh, most recent um, acquisition of Onshape, um, you have also sent out an open letter to all production companies. Um, talking about the value of SaaS, um, how do you think the world of cloud SaaS uh, is going to change what happens in the OT space? Let's say SaaS has changed most software industries dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, I and, and, and my customers 
actually live in one little corner of the software world that's not been touched by SaaS so far. Right. And that's because it's a hard problem to solve. You know, uh, our software is compute intensive, it's graphics intensive, it deals with massive amounts of data. And uh, historically, it's been hard to serve that up from mm -hmm. the cloud. But, uh, you know, the Onshape guys have some incredible breakthroughs. And really what they promise, you know, over the coming years is to be able to deliver all this digital transformation power at a fraction of the cost. And really it's the, it's the cost of owning the technology after the project's done, you know, when you're, you're in kind of in long-term production, the cost of upgrades, the cost of patches, all that cost just goes away. Right. Uh, and as do the system administrators. And you get the benefit, you know, at a, at a much more attractive uh, cost plateau. So um, I think Onshape will be mm -hmm. very important. Uh, you know, it'll take a few years because our industry really has not even their toe in the water yet. But uh, They don't even have their data on the cloud yet, yeah, right. especially when it comes to operating data. Yeah, and there's a lot of misconceptions mm -hmm. to overcome. I mean, a lot of uh, industrial companies say, well, the cloud's not secure. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, it's more secure than their own <laughs> IT systems are and, and well, so forth. So... There's, there's some work that we need to do need and to could do. use your help, but yeah. um, I'm sure that as the customers realize the power they can get at a much lower cost of ownership profile, right. this technology will gain a lot of traction as it has mm -hmm. in almost other, all other uh, software marketplaces. Brilliant. And Jim, uh, you have been a technologist at heart, and uh, I fondly remember you showing me your home automation and, and other projects. So what are you doing in your spare time these days? What are you playing with? <laughs> Well, uh, one of the things I'm playing with uh, with some of my guys back at work is the idea of a real-time spatial digital twin mm -hmm. of, for example, a uh, factory or a plant. Like um, you mean holographic? Hol Three-dimensional, okay. for sure. That could support either uh, virtual reality mm -hmm. for distant use cases right. or augmented reality if you're actually there. But a lot of times the 3D models, mm -hmm. you know, you can capture a 3D model of a space these days yeah. pretty readily with cameras but then it changes. Mm -hmm. And so how do you have a 3D model of a space that could support AR and VR use cases and analytics that's always up to date? You know, if an AGV drives by, you mm -hmm. see it drive by in the 3D model. That's a powerful, powerful concept and we're making some great progress on that. Every time I see it, I get excited <laughs> because uh, the analytics we're gonna be able to do. Right. Just think of like uh, the path that every worker in a factory works all day mm -hmm. and being able to sit back and just observe all that with analytics wow. and immediately see more efficient layouts, right? It's amazing. It's, it's amazing. So uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming there. I'm uh, excited uh, about it. That's really exciting, Jim. And um, I can't thank you enough for sparing the time today and uh, sharing with us these thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.